Alrighty guys, so like I mentioned, today we are going to be talking about population genetics. Now when we're talking about population genetics, let's break down what that word means. So population, if we think about the population of the human race, we're talking about all humans on the planet Earth, right? That is our population. So when we're talking about population genetics, we're talking about the genes or the genetics what traits are present in that population. So it could be a population of turtles, it could be a population of elk, it could be a population of geese. So we're looking at the entire grouping of those organisms. Okay. So our goal here today, which you guys don't need to jot this part down, but our goal here today is to be able to calculate what is the frequency or the amount of dominant and recessive alleles or letters in a population. So that might sound really scary, but I can tell you it's very simple. It's very simple calculations that we'll be doing here. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So again, when we're talking about genetic variation in any population of organisms, here we can see a population of emperor penguins. There are, there are going to be slight differences between those organisms. Is that clear what they're waiting? Thanks, man. So, uh, if we look at this population of penguins, for example, most of them look very similar. But some of them are going to have slightly different characteristics. Some of them are going to have uh, different types of wings. Some of them are going to have different types of webbed feet. Some of them are going to have different colorations on their chest. And that's all going to be a product of just normal variation. If we look around this room right now, we have a wide variety of different genetic variations, things like hair color, eye color, height. So all of those things contribute to make you a person. Now we can go ahead and calculate what the allele frequency is in our classroom, for example, for brown hair. We know whether or not hair color is dominant or recessive. <clears throat> Now, genetic variation is based on what traits will help make certain organisms survive better. So like I mentioned earlier with these penguins, there might be slightly different uh, wing shapes. And some of those wing shapes allow some of those penguins that have that particular wing shape, allow them to be able to swim better through the water, allowing them to hunt prey and evade predators better. So those traits, those alleles, those genes, will increase in that population if that gives that species or that uh, group of organisms an advantage. Now we want genetic variation. We don't want all of the organisms in a population to be completely the same. If they are completely identical and a disease comes through and it wipes out one of those penguins in this population, let's say, it's going to wipe out all of them. So we want genetic variation. Genetic variation is a good thing for a population to have. Okay. So genetic variation leads to changes in phenotypes. So let's think about this word here, phenotypes. And I'd like you to actually add this uh, to your notes here. And I'm going to write this definition on the board for those of you at home. And those of you who are listening after the fact, you might just need to kind of pause it and listen to what my words are here. <clears throat> so a genotype is going to be the alleles or the genes Notice how there's genes in genotype that code for a specific trait. The phenotype 
is going to be the physical characteristics of that trait. So for example here, if we're talking about these uh, finches, so each of them has a different genotype, you know, uppercase letter, lowercase letter, or a combination of the two, <clears throat> to give them a different type of trait. So in this case, we we're looking at the beak shape. And this is something that Charles Darwin was researching on the Galapagos Islands. So he looked at the different beaks that finches had, and they used his inferences about looking at those beaks and noticing, huh, these large crushing beaks are for eating seeds. And they work really well at eating seeds. And then these smaller, more narrow beaks, those are more for hunting insects because they can really quickly grab a very small thing. So he noticed that the beaks were perfectly adapted for whatever that finch was eating. So again, that's acting on the phenotype. <clears throat> so those organisms that can't swim as well, can't eat the food as well, if they have a trait that's less favorable, they're going to not survive as well. And that's going to cause them to decrease in that population. So that process is called natural selection. And that's a huge concept that we're going to be exploring here over the next month. So natural selection is a process by which nature is choosing which organisms survive and which organisms do not because of what traits they have, because of their phenotypes. Okay. All right. So, again, we want to have a lot of different phenotypes. We want to have a lot of different characteristics in a population. That's going to keep them very healthy. <clears throat> if an environment changes, if we have many different types of an organism that exist within a population, they're more likely to survive changes due to climate change, changes due to um, human colonization of an area, changes due to a disease that comes through, or different organisms that are competing against uh, our population of organisms. <laughs> so again, the greater that range in phenotypes, the more likely some individuals can survive even if things change in that environment. Okay. Now, another key term that uh, we should kind of get an idea of is a gene pool. So if we look at these frogs, for example, here, all of these letters that are represented by these different colors of these frogs is going to represent our gene pool. It's all of the letters that code for a particular trait. In this case, let's say that we're looking at the color of these frogs. So we've got some green frogs and we've got some brown frogs. So let's say that green frog, so the big G here, is dominant to brown frogs, which is the little g. So the only way for a frog to be brown is if they have two of those little letters, two of those recessive alleles. Now, what we can do is we can actually take and count each of those alleles to figure out how much of that population, how much of this, these frogs that are living in this little pond here, how much of them have big Gs and how much of them have little Gs. <clears throat> so if we look here, we can calculate the what's called allele frequency. Now that's a basically a somewhat scary term that uh, tells us how many big G's and little G's there are. That's all it does. 
So don't get too scared of that terminology there. So if we look at each of our frogs, we have three of them that are big G, big G, homozygous dominant. We have one green frog that is heterozygous, big G, little g. And then we have two frogs that are brown, so little g, little g here. Okay. So if we look here, we can just count the number of big Gs and count the number of little Gs we have. So if we have three homozygous dominant frogs, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, bless you, big Gs in the homozygous dominant, and then we have one big G in the heterozygous one. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So we've got seven big Gs in our gene pool here. And then for brown frogs, we have two that are homozygous recessive. So that's one, two, three, four, little g's. And then we have one more in this heterozygous individual here. So that gives us a total of five little g's. So if we add the two of those up, seven plus five, that gives us 12 total letters in our gene pool. Okay. 12 total alleles in our gene pool. So now we can just figure out, okay, what is seven out of 12? Seven divided by 12, that's gonna tell us the total percentage or the total frequency of this population that is big G. And then we can do the same thing for little g's here. So we've got five little g's in our gene pool. Five divided by 12 is gonna give us our percentage of the recessive allele. And that's the extent of the math, to be honest. It's simple division and then working with percentages. So really nothing too crazy there. Okay. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions about kind of how we went through that there? Really not too complicated. Okay. Anybody at home have any questions? Okay, cool. So, wow, that's really difficult to see on my screen. I wonder if you guys can see that there. Um, okay. So, uh, looking at this here, I'd like to go through some brief practice. And to be honest, these ones we'll just do kind of together. And then we'll transition into looking at some more practice with uh, Punnett squares and dihybrid crosses. So for those of you at home, I'd like you guys to open up assignment 2.02. .02. So that's this uh, allele frequency and monohybrid cross practice. Uh, so if you guys could please go ahead and open that up. And you can either follow along. I'd recommend just following along on a separate sheet of paper because um, we're going to kind of go through most of this together here. And then whatever we don't end up getting through, we'll just have to finish by Sunday by 11.59 p.m., which we should have plenty of time to do this here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and dish this out to those of us who are in person. Nope. Yeah, paper What's up? guys, it's little things like passing out papers. I didn't realize how much I missed it, but I totally did. It was so weird. The first time I passed out some sheets of paper, I was like, oh, this is a nice nostalgic little thing that we haven't been able to do a while. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at our first example here. So does everyone at home, do you guys have 2.02 uh, .02 pulled up? Yeah, okay. All right, so definitely make sure you get that pulled up if you don't already. And, uh, oh, hold on one moment. Let me get my 
set up here. Hold on one sec while I get my little thing queued up here. Can you guys all see this at home okay? Can you guys see this at home? Okay, cool. Thank you, Riley. All right. So if we look at this first example here, and we need to kind of talk about what traits we're talking about for a second. So we're talking about pea plants. So we're talking about little uh, plants that make peas. <laughs> Uh, so some of them are going to have green seeds, some of them are going to have yellow seeds, some of them are going to have smooth pods, some of them are going to have constricted pods, some of them are going to have axial flowers, and some of them are going to have terminal flowers. Uh, so to be honest, I mean, we don't need to know too much about what this term means. Uh, axial just basically means it's along the center, and then terminal means it's along the end. So not a huge deal there. <laughs> so if we look at this here, Let's say that we're looking at the green and yellow characteristics. So if we remember, green seeds are going to be big G. Ooh, yeah, whatever. Little g are going to be yellow seeds. Okay. <clears throat> so if we look here, we're, we've been given, instead of given total numbers of our <clears throat> number of each of our alleles, we've been given percentages. So if we look here, 24% uh, of the population is homozygous green, 44% of our population is homozygous yellow, and then 32% of our population is heterozygous. So what we're trying to do is figure out the total amount of that that's big G and the total amount of that that's little g. So real quick, if G is big G, sorry, is green, and we have 24% homozygous green, what would be the genotype here, everybody? What letters would we have? Right, we get a, have a pair of big Gs. So big G, big G here. Okay, how about the homozygous yellow? Little G, little G, right. Okay. Now, the heterozygous individual, just like we had talked about earlier, heterozygous means that it's half big G, half little g, right? So let's say that this half is big G and this half is little g here. So real quick, what's half of 32%? 16%, yep. So that means that this side is 16% big G. And this side is 16% little g. So essentially the way we find the total percentage or the total frequency, which when we say frequency, we're talking about a percentage value here. <clears throat> we're just going to go ahead and add the percentages for big G. So here we have 24% big G, big G, or 24% big G here. And then we have 16% big G here. So if we add the two of those together, 24 plus 16, that gives us 40%. So what that's saying is, is that 40% of our population, okay, so that's going to be uh, those two sections right there are going to be big G. So now we'll do the same thing for little g here. Okay, so we've got 44% 
that our little g, yellow, and then we've got another 16% that's little g from this one up here. So if we add the two of those up, 44 plus 16%, that's going to give us 60%. <clears throat> so what that means is, is in our gene pool, 40% of our genes or our alleles are going to be big G. 60% are going to be little g. And notice how you will always, if you add them together, it's must always equal 100%. If it doesn't add up to 100%, we need to go back and check some of our work there. Okay. Alrighty, guys. So I'd like you to go ahead and try population two there on your own, and then we'll come back together here in just a moment and uh, check that out here and see what you guys come up with. Go ahead and try population two there. Okay, give you guys about 30 more seconds. You got it? Cool. So at this point, I'd like you to turn to someone in your table group and kind of share your answers. See if you guys got the same thing. If you got something different, go ahead and chat it out and see what happened there. And then so unfortunately, obviously, you guys at home, I think that would be a little bit troublesome. So if you guys could just hang out for a 45 seconds here until we get going, that'd be great. Okay. Alrighty, guys. So what we should have came up with here is something similar to this. So we should have gotten 14% big P and then 86% little P. Here, I just realized it's probably a little difficult to... I see that all the way up the Yeah, in the watch. Yeah, it would be the exact same. Because essentially, you know, if you look at a task, half of that, the 38% is one little key. I think it's a 
And if that works for you, you do that. Okay. All right. So, any questions with that? Did anyone get anything different? Okay. All right. So, let's go ahead and try that third one. Same deal, except now we're, we don't have a little pie chart there. We're just dealing with the numbers, which, frankly, that's much more realistic to one of our actual questions that we'll have. So go ahead and give that one a shot there. So what we should have came up with for this one was an actual 50-50 split. So if you look at your 36% here, if we divide that in half, that gives us uh, two sets of 18%, right? So 18% big A, 18% little a. So all we'll do is we'll just add 32% for the axial, which was big A. Sorry, we should probably write that out. So this is homozygous axial, that's big A, big A. Terminal is little a, little a. Okay. And so, when we're looking at this here, okay, uh, we've got 32% plus that 18, that gives us 50. Same thing for the recessive trait, 32% plus 18 gives us 50%. So as you guys can see, the math here is pretty simple. It's really nothing too crazy. Um, and some of our, our questions will get a little bit more into just giving you guys numbers, and you might have to calculate those percentages. So I might say that, you know, three out of seven of our frogs have homozygous dominant, and you'll have to figure out what that would be for a percentage. That's kind of the biggest extension that we'll make from that. Okay? So does anyone have any questions about calculating allele frequencies before we go ahead and transition forward here? Cool. Awesome. Awesome. So for those of you at home, uh, if you could scroll down to kind of the next page there. And then for us here in person, uh, the other little thing I wanted to talk about with the last little bit of class is uh, punch squares, essentially, and simple, what we call monohybrid crosses. Now, to be honest, uh, we should have enough time to finish this. The last question might take us a little bit closer to the end of class. Um, so if we don't quite get through that last question, we'll just have to do how uh, the rest of my stuff is. I don't think any of us have too much difficulty. Which, uh, I don't know if we've talked about it while I'm walking around here. Uh, by the way, our Friday schedules are not going to change at all. So it's always still going to just be an enter the biosphere, and that's kind of like your attendance check. My rationale behind that is I feel like you guys can take advantage of that time much better kind of get caught up on any missing work that you have in the week or just make sure you finish everything by Sunday. So that's kind of my rationale for doing that. Hey, man, do you want me to hang this up here so you don't clock your head on it? Yeah, no worries. Now, uh, if you guys find that you're struggling with these, I have posted a digital version of this. And any time that we do something in person, uh, I'm not expecting that you guys at home do a 
both the in-person paper version and the virtual version. Um, but I do post it to all of you, number one, for convenience for both of us. And also, uh, so that way, if there's any extra resources in here, like, for example, uh, these on the digital version, these are hyperlinked to uh, some videos uh, to kind of just review how to do mo simple monohybrid crosses. So you can feel free to use that if you feel like you need that little bit of extra resource there. Okay, so uh, in talking about pea plants, you know, with that last one here, uh, we should talk a little bit briefly about Gregor Mendel. So Gregor Mendel was actually a monk who uh, worked in a monastery, and he grew these pea plants for the monastery. And when he was growing these different plants, he noticed that he could create different characteristics, different traits, by breeding them in a specific way. So basically what he did was he bred hundreds of generations of these peas, and he was able to figure out that Punnett squares are a way that we can show how traits are passed from parents to offspring. So, um, and that's kind of the big idea of what we're trying to get at here. So what we're trying to do is look at each of these different examples, and we are going to figure out what the genotypic ratios, basically what the percentages are for the letters, and then what that means for the phenotypes here. Okay? All right, so in this case here, and again, we're talking about that simple dominance. So we're never going to have like a mix of the two. So in this case here, we've got these flowers. We've got red flowers and we've got white flowers. So let's say that the red parent flower is big R, big R. So homozygous dominant. Let's say that the other flower here, let's say that this was the female uh, parts on the flower here they are going to be white, okay? So they are going to be the recessive trait, so the only possible genotype they could have is little r, little r. So looking at this here, all of our genotypes are big R, little r. So we would write that as our genotypes for big R, little r are 100%, because they're all big R, little r. Which uh, maybe, in case you're not sure, maybe we should write this down, that this is parent one up here. And that this is parent number two. So these are the two parents. These are the potential offspring. So there's one, two, three, four potential offspring. Okay. Now when we're talking about the phenotype, remember the phenotype is going to be the physical characteristic or the physical trait. <clears throat> Whereas the genotype is the genes or the alleles. All right. So let's look at this one. Uh, together here. Okay, so we're going to cross little r, little r with big R, little r. And just a quick reminder, it doesn't matter if you put which one where, but they do need to be grouped together. So basically, if, it's, if one of them is little r, little r, it has to be either on the top or on the side for little r, little r. Okay. So let's try and work through this one real quick. So we've got, for one offspring, we've got big R, little r. For a second one, we've got big R, little r. The third one, we've got little r, little r. And the fourth one, we've got little r, little r. <clears throat> now again, keep in mind that this would have been a white parent, and this would have been a red parent here. Okay, so we've got two potential genotypes here. We've got big R, little r. So what percentage is big R, little r here? 50. 50, right, it's half. Is that? Yes, exactly, Michael. All right. 
right, so the other half would be little r, little r. Now, in this case, our phenotypes are going to match that. So we've got 50% big R, little r. So what color would those plants be? Red. Red, because they have one of our dominant letters. If even one dominant letter is there, they're going to show that dominant trait. So that means that for the red color, that would be 50%. And as I don't think we really need to pose this to you guys, you can probably figure it out. But for the recessive trait, little r, little r, so the flowers that are white, that's also going to be 50%. Okay. So... Um, to be honest, I kind of want to change this one. I'm going to change this because essentially this is saying the exact same thing as this one up here. And to be honest, that's not really as exciting. <laughs> Let's make it slightly more interesting. I want to give you the exact same answer. So instead of... Um, yeah. So... Basically, what I'd like us to do, we're just, we're just going to scrap this whole thing, <laughs> to be honest. We're going to cross this with two people who are heterozygous for tongue rolling. And even though I crossed it out here, big R means that you can roll your tongue. Little r means you cannot roll your tongue. Just to kind of clarify that for you. So we've got big R, little r, big R, little r. So I'd like you guys to try that one on your own here. I'll give you guys a couple minutes to list out the offspring, the genotypes that we would see, and the phenotypes that we would see. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so I want to make sure I we'll we'll definitely have enough time to get through this, but we we'll kind of have to boogie a little bit. All right. So, same thing, if you guys could please turn to a neighbor real quick, compare your answers. See what you guys got. Okay. So how many of you guys got the same answer? Give me a thumbs up if you got the same answer real quick. Okay. Looks like most of us. Some of us uh, still need some more practice, and that's okay. <clears throat> All right. So let's go ahead and just walk through this one together. So here we've got big R, big R. Here we've got big R, little r. Big R, little r. Which, by the way, we're never going to write this as little r, big R. The uppercase letter always comes first. So if you wrote it that way, 
I mean, it's not the end of the world, but we just don't typically write it that way. Uh, and then the bottom right corner here for offspring four is going to be little r, little r. So if we look, we have all three possible combinations of this here. Okay. So 25% or one quarter of our offspring are big R, big R. 50% or two out of four are going to be big R, little r. 25% are going to be little r, little r. Okay, so then for the phenotypes here, remember that big R, big R, and big R, little r means that you can roll your tongue. The only way you cannot roll your tongue is if you're little r, little r. Oops, sorry. So if you can roll your tongue, you're going to add the two percentages for big R, big R, and big R, little r. Because as long as they have one of those uppercase letters, that means that they'll be able to roll their tongue. So we add the two of those up, 25% plus 50% gives us 75% can roll. <clears throat> so then the percentage that cannot roll their tongue is going to be this little r, little r. So 25%. Oh my gosh, I'm losing lead bits here left and right. Here we go. Okay. So is that making sense, guys? Okay. Cool. So we're going to wrap this up with this last question here. And it's a little bit more of a real world question. And it has to do with albinism. So if, uh, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with albinism or basically being albino, <clears throat> that is a uh, abnormality in the pigmentation of the skin. So that oftentimes causes them to be very, very pale. They don't have the same uh, pigments as someone who does not have this uh, condition. So I'm sorry, what were you saying, Nate? Oh, I was just saying that you did really pale. Yes, yeah. So your skin just doesn't have the proper... Uh, pigments in it. Okay, so let's say in this example, albinism is going to be a recessive trait, which it actually is in real life. So people who are albinos must be homozygous recessive. Okay, that's the only way you can be albino. Mr. and Mrs. Gooden have two children. Their older son, Mark, has normal pigmentation but their son, Steve, is an albino. Both parents have normal pigmentation. So it, first, let's talk about the different options here of what we can have. And actually here, I can, we can just put that in the box. I don't know why I'm putting it on the side there. So <clears throat> we can have big A, big A. So that means that this person will have normal pigmentation. We can be big A, little a, which means that they're going to be a carrier. So a carrier is someone who doesn't have the trait, but can pass it on to their offspring. And the only way to be albino is to be homozygous recessive. So if we think about this here, and let's look at this example more. So Mr. and Mrs. Good have two children. Their older son, Mark, has normal pigmentation, but their son, Steve, is albino. So let's start backwards with Steve. What is the only possible genotype that Steve has? Right, little a, little a. That's the only possibility because that's the only time that we could get albino. So now from there, that actually tells us a little bit about Mr. and Mrs. Good. So does anybody have an idea? They can only have one genotype. What might it be? So yeah, go for it. So one of them has to have a, a uppercase, like normal pigment, I guess. 
So if we think about that here, let's actually just run through a quick little Punnett square on the side. So if one of the parents is big A, big A, right? And then let's say that the other parent is, because they're both normal, right? So they don't have, neither of them are little a, little a. So let's say that the other one is big A, little a. Let's run through here. So if we look there, none of the offspring could be albino. Right. So I'm I'm sorry, kind of cut you off there. Could you say that again, bud? Right. So this person who's a carrier has normal pigment. So they both have to be carriers? They both have to be carriers. That's the only possibility. So that means, which I guess we'll do this here in a sec, but they'll both be heterozygous. So let's kind of just run through that here real quick. Okay. We've got big A, big A, big A, little A, big A, little A, and little A, little A. Right. So that means that this ending outcome was what happened to Steve. Steve got a little A from mom and a little A from dad. Mark could be either normal pigmentation or a carrier. We just don't know. But we know that he's at least one of those two. So thinking about this here, what's the likelihood of their next child, if they were to have one, to have normal pigmentation? 25%. To have normal pigmentation. 75%. 75 percent, right. So they would have a 75% chance of normal pigmentation. So, so that's three out of the four. Okay. And then they would have a 25% chance of having another albino child. Okay. So these next two questions are really just kind of conceptual questions. So let's just kind of talk through them real quick. So if the Goodens already have an albino child, is that going to change the likelihood that their next child will be albino? What do you guys think? No. Each time that we get this mixture happening of combining these alleles, it's completely independent every time. So they could have four more kids that are albino. They could have no more kids that are albino. Okay. It's all completely uh, different for each time. And then does anybody have an idea what might be a possible disadvantage to being albino? Right. You're very sensitive to light, but what else? Why might that be a problem? Hold on, guys. Hold on, guys. Quit backing up. Why might it be a problem to have that really pale skin? Right. You're going to be much more at risk of getting skin cancer from that ultraviolet radiation. The pigment in your skin actually helps you absorb that ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, so at this point, you guys can go ahead and hang on to these. I will not be collecting them. Um, we will pick up with this next one. On your way out, if you could please make sure to take a pump or two of the hand sanitizer, that would be awesome. Uh, and we're going to try and make that a little bit more of a habit moving forward uh, just because we're not sterilizing as much stuff. So thank you guys so much. Have a fantastic day, and we will see you guys next week. Keep it real, everybody. Hey, hey. so how's it going, man? Uh, good now.